before we start our last talk for today, uh, two announcements. First of all, there will be a Q&A uh, session tomorrow, and this is for you. That is, anything you wanted to ask about many body physics, high temperature superconductivity, SYK model, etc., etc., this is your time. You can uh, come up uh, with questions from the last week, and the lecturers are supposed to be here, and we'll try to the best of our ability uh, to answer our, your questions. And uh, the only thing which will not be allowed is to uh, use this time to show 10 more slides from the lecture because there was no time during uh, the lecture. But because this is a session for you, it will be also natural if someone from the audience would be uh, the moderator. Do we have a volunteer to chair this session? Come on, guys. It's not, you know, I'm doing this all, all the time and I'm still alive, almost. <clears throat> okay. You think about it and we'll ask once again. On a more festive note, some of you know that tomorrow is a holiday in Italy, our 15th uh, of August. This wouldn't have any effect on us. We'll proceed as usual. The bar is supposed to be open, but Tonight, there will be uh, a festivity here in the main building in our cafeteria. There will be a buffet dinner, drinks, or music, uh, and it will go from 7.30 till 11. Uh, the price is either two half meal coupons or 10 euros. Okay. So with that, our, own, our Capitolnik will, if he finds a, a, a clicker, or his laptop will give us the second part of his lecture. Okay, um, I'll have to go and, and click on the computer because one of the previous speakers uh, decided to take it home. Um, okay, so uh, we continue now with uh, this discussion on uh, measurements of time reversal symmetry breaking. In particular, we are looking at optical effects. Uh, last the, the last thing we did is uh, we looked at a very simple fundamental experiment that tells us how going through a material that breaks time reversal symmetry uh, is different than any other material that may rotate polarization uh, but does not break time reversal symmetry. Uh, that is, it is uh, reciprocal. So uh, we saw that and we saw that what we want to do is uh, we want to use the time reversed uh, state for the beam of light, which is basically uh, light going in the opposite direction, which we can easily achieve using a mirror. Okay, so um, remember, I started uh, the discussion uh, discussing um, um, time reverse asymmetry breaking, then unconventional superconductors, and now. Uh, we are, uh, and then we discussed uh, the, the, the way to measure it with optical effects, and now we are back uh, to, to the, oh, help is coming. Oh, okay. Try with this. Um, wait. This one is. Okay, good. Bear with me. To get rid of that, which
Good. And now we'll do this. And it works. Yeah. Okay. 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 So uh, we are back now to uh, unconventional superconductors. We are going to bring things uh, together for, for this discussion. Uh, so um, we already saw that uh, uh, what started the field, the search for time reversal symmetry breaking uh, in anion superconductors, uh, actually uh, was, was eventually uh, was not what people looked for. Uh, uh, superconduct I mean, the high temperature superconductors were shown not to be anion superconductors. Uh, those initial measurements that showed large effect turned to be uh, reciprocal effect. That is, that they don't break time reversal symmetry. And the question uh, was where now? And then uh, what happened is that uh, over time, uh, uh, people have been uh, looking at other types of, of materials, such as uh, superconducting ferromagnets, heavy fermions, etc., uh, which are more general materials uh, for which the gap function has uh, both real and imaginary part, and therefore break time reversal symmetry. We discussed it in the first le lecture uh, why that is so. Uh, in principle, if you have both real and imaginary part, uh, then uh, this has two options, uh, um, delta R plus I delta I and delta R minus I delta I. And in a way, uh, these are it's a two states, uh, just like an icing state, therefore breaks time reversal symmetry. Um, so as it's shown here, I showed it to you before, if these parts, this F function, where delta naught is the magnitude, uh, both are non-zero, uh, we have we have time of asymmetry breaking, uh, and uh, as a counterexample, uh, the D wave of high TC uh, is a single uh, singlet uh, order parameter, and it does not break time of asymmetry. Okay, so let's get to a situation uh, that does break time of asymmetry. For example, uh, I have a real and imaginary part for the gap function, and I'm going to use the simplest case. The simplest case is that that has an amplitude up front, and then uh, uh, the internal uh, structure in the uh, center of mass of the Cooper pair uh, has this uh, uh, K, uh, Kx plus minus Iky. Now, you all notice there is single uh, power of the momentum. Single power of the momentum means L equal 1. This particular one is the so-called P plus IP. I mean, multiply it by H bar, then it's PX plus minus IPY. And if you remember your, your uh, um, uh, expansion, multiple expansion, then PX plus minus IPY are Cooper pairs moving uh, one way and another way, OK, in a circle. Well, it already starts to look like magnetism, you have this charge moving in a circle, charge moving in a circle is a magnetic moment, it starts to, to make sense that time reversal symmetry indeed will be broken. Uh, so that's basically what we expect. So let's try and use this intuition uh, to calculate uh, what should be the effect, okay? So the way I'm gonna do it is, um, just like I did it at the very beginning of the lectures, I used the, the, the current to calculate a magnetic moment. Now the current is the current of the, of the Cooper pairs. Uh, they are running around with L equal plus one running one way, L equal minus one uh, running the other way, therefore producing a magnetic moment that is either up or down. You all remember uh, 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 the relation between magnetic moment and angular momentum, right? Uh, if I know the angular momentum, I just multiply it. Now it's a Cooper pair. They will have charge E star and mass M star. Of course, it's 2E and, and 2M, uh, which I can plug it in. But uh, just in case, we, we, we have the relation between the angular momentum and the magnetic moment for a single Cooper pair. Now I know the density of the Cooper pairs. I can multiply it by the density of the Cooper pairs. That's Ns. And now I have a magnetization. 
right? Given by this angular momentum. Remember, again, ns is n over 2, e star is 2e, m star is 2me, uh, right? Very simple. So having a magnetization, I can calculate a current. That's one way, I mean, one step towards calculating the optical conductivity. Remember, optical conductivity is going to give me the Kerr effect, right? That was the relation that it's the, uh, of the diagonal term of the of the conductivity that is going to give me the term. So I want to calculate current. If I have the magnetization, do you remember how do I calculate current? What do I do? What do I? Very good. So in this very simple calculation, I'm going to take the curl to calculate the magnetization. But before that, I have a problem. Because, yes? Yes. Yes. So of the Cooper pill. Yes. That's a condensate. They are all. They all are in the same state. Obviously, I can have domains, and one domain may have uh, the, the L equal plus one. Another domain will have L equal minus one. But let's say a single domain. I have all the Cooper pills uh, with, with one of the L's, plus one or minus one, OK? So in principle, yes? Yes? Um, well, in principle, yes. And what I'm doing here, I'm, as you probably well know very well. I, all I want is to, to have an, uh, some intuition on, 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 on getting uh, the calculation of the Kerr effect. Uh, this method, in fact, uh, was invented uh, for, taking care, uh, for calculating uh, the, the moment and therefore uh, the, the uh, current in, in helium-3. Uh, there, uh, the situation is, is much clearer, but obviously what what Andre said is uh, need to be taken into account. But let's say that, that I can keep track on all those uh, Cooper pairs running around in, in, uh, in, in circles. Um, and, and I add them up, and I get uh, the total magnetization. But there is one thing which, in fact, not, is not unrelated to, the, to this comment uh, that I need to remember. And this thing is that. Uh, once you see that, even before calculating the current, uh, you can say, hey, you calculate, calculated magnetization. Let's go to a magnetometer and measure it. Well, yes, people thought about it. But there is a problem. And the problem is that uh, while at first it indeed may look like an orbital ferromagnet, that is, you you have magnetic moments that are all orbital in origin. Add them all together, it's like a ferromagnet, right? But there is a problem because it's a superconductor. And superconductor does not like the magnetization within it and will screen it using Meissner currents, OK? So in principle, we expect m equal to 0 in a single domain infinite sample. However, and I'll come to it uh, uh, in a, a particular example, um, if you have surfaces, they are edge states. And if you have domain walls, there are uh, currents along the domain walls. And therefore, uh, uh, this requirement of m equal to 0 uh, may be relaxed there. And indeed, there were searches in some of these materials uh, for, for such currents. But otherwise, if I simply consider a single domain large sample, then there is not going to be any magnetization. So I cannot really put it in a magnetometer and measure the magnetiza this magnetization. Yes? Well, uh, no. Uh, if it's a bulk, if it's a bulk, this is not a, there is no magnetic field uh, here. So there, there, I don't need uh, to, to have uh, any flux coming in 
uh, in this in this uh, in this system. I'm I'm in the bulk, and in in principle, there is not going to be any magnetization anyway. I mean, there are going to be all the magnetization is screened uh, at any. In fact, at any length scale above the coherence length, it's going to be screened. Okay, so uh, coming back to to that um, um, calculation, um, as uh, we noted, uh, if I have the magnetization and I want to calculate now uh, conductivity in order to uh, obtain uh, the, the care effect, uh, I start with this magnetization and I want to take the curl of this magnetization, right? Uh, in principle, um, there is no magnetic field, so the only thing that, that appears in B, right, B is M plus H, the only thing that will appear is the magnetization. I'm going to take uh, uh, the, the uh, curl of this magnetization, uh, and now it's very simple. I have this magnetization, uh, taking the curl uh, is taking, taking the curl of uh, whatever there is here, I'm going from, I mean, ns is simply uh, uh, n over 2. I, can, uh, I need to take, uh, in a way, you can uh, retransform the curl into z. Z is the direction uh, of, the, of that uh, uh, angular momentum uh, moment. Uh, so it's z cross the gradient of the density. The gradient of the density is related to the gradient in the chemical potential. Uh, plus uh, the multiplication by the nd mu. That's a standard uh, way I go from, from the gradient in the density to the density of states times the gradient in the, in the uh, chemical potential. Remember, this is the full chemical potential, and this is extremely important. Um, and now, OK, what is the chemical potential? You remember Josephson relation? The chemical poten potential for a Cooper pair uh, is 2e times the voltage across the sample. And then uh, I have uh, that, that time derivative part of the phase, and the phase have uh, the static part plus the vector potential. Okay? So this is the full uh, uh, chemical potential, and I need to take its, its gradient. Okay? So I take this gradient. And then uh, there is going to be, uh, once I do that, using this expression, believe me, uh, what you get if you realize that sigma xy for a normal material system is simply e squared over h uh, and 1 over 2d, where d uh, is, is some thickness of the, of the material, then you get sigma xy times the z, z direction and then cross with this piece. OK, any guesses what the result is? Well, actually, not guesses. You should all know what is, what is written here. Well, if I were you, I would, I would say, well, if you really ask what it is, it can either be infinity or 0. Well, because otherwise, why it should be? It's 0. Why is it 0? Sorry? It's not just E and M. It's, it's E and M plus the fact that this is the London equation. And if you take now uh, this London equation uh, and, and you see that this is DJS dt, uh, and that's the electric field, just plug it in here, you get 0. Well, this is what you get, 0. So, in principle, we worked all the way, all this, in order to say that, well, in principle, there should not be any care effect for this time reversal symmetry. Well, with this simple, by the way, I, I could, instead of P plus IP, I could do D plus ID, D plus IP, anything you want uh, will yield the exact same thing, okay? It's just a little bit more complicated. I mean, at the end, it's just this angular momentum and... Believe me, you get zero. But, um, you know, that's disappointing. So the question is whether there is or not a care effect for this kind of time reversal symmetry breaking superconductors. Well, it turned that there is, because 
If you remember um, that uh, um, uh, this is probably more familiar to you, uh, the, the issue of, of anomalous Hall effect, uh, then, then you get a Hall effect because of several types of scattering. One of them is skew scattering. So suppose there, there are impurities. And here you do not need magnetic impurities because if it is a time reverse asymmetry breaking uh, material, then any impurity uh, is, is uh, going to cause uh, uh, skew scattering. Uh, this was proposed and calculated by, by Gorio and Luchin uh, um, uh, immediately after some experiments, of course, our experiments that I'm going to talk about. And it was shown that skew scattering uh, is going to produce a care effect. Um, so, okay, that's one way to do it. But then there is another way which is much more relevant uh, for these type of, of superconductors, these time reverse asymmetry breaking superconductors, uh, and in particular, as people uh, learn how to make them better and better with, with uh, lower residual resistivity and larger uh, 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 triple R ratio, et cetera, et cetera. I'll show you some results on material with triple R, uh, which is the resistance at room temperature divided by the resistance at around 4 Kelvin, uh, which is about 1,000. That's a very clean material. And that is multiband superconductors. Well, it turned that if you have a multiband superconductor and any coupling between the bands, it's enough to produce uh, a, finite, a finite care effect. Okay? So uh, this calculation, uh, I mean, here I'm following... Uh, calculation of, of Taylor and Cathy Cullen. There are other types of calculations uh, along this line by now. Uh, but basically, uh, there are now ad other indices. One and two are now the band indices. This is the simplest example of two bands. Uh, in strontium ruthenate, which is a material I'm going to talk about uh, soon, shortly, uh, then uh, there are three bands uh, in uranium platinum three, uh, which I'll show you results. There are five bands. There are coupling between the bands. We know that. Uh, so this is not a surprise. So as a toy model, we take two bands. Uh, and therefore, initially, there is a different uh, gap on each one of the bands. And there, is, there are gaps associated with the coupling. And then uh, one can work through the calculation uh, of, the, uh, of the care effect, which is through this calculation, basically uh, similar to what I I showed you, yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 Sorry, I. Yes. Yes. No, the London, the London equation works, but if you want, no, but if you want, you have, you have two inequivalent bands. And it is this, the coupling between the bands uh, that, I mean, it's like you would think that, that you have one London equation in one band and another London equation in another band. These, these each will cancel, but then there are coupling, and that does not cancel. In a, a, if you have Cooper pairs that belong to more than one band, then, then the London equation is not the simple London equation. Yes? Yes. Yes. There is interband component. And what you said, actually, these are two different approaches uh, that were taken, one uh, by, by uh, the group of uh, uh, Annette, uh, which looks at, at single orbital, uh, orbitals, and, and by Cathy Cullen that, that looks at, at the full band. Um, in any event, again, not to go through these calculations, uh, you can uh, look at these two papers uh, uh, as these examples. Uh, what what uh, one finds is that, uh, again, you go through the machinery, uh, but now there is a finite care effect, and it is proportional to the interband coupling. 
this epsilon one two. If this is zero, then you do not have a care effect because of the same reason as, as before. If this is non-zero, you do have it, and it is proportional uh, if you measure at some frequency omega, uh, it is proportional to the principal gaps, uh, the, the product of the principal uh, gaps. And if the two gaps are, say, of the same size, it's going to be this gap square. Okay. Now, I want you to notice a few things. Uh, first, gaps in superconductors are of the size of TC. Now, I'm going to talk about materials that are not necessarily high temperature superconductors. They are going to be to have a TC um, of order of one Kelvin, half a Kelvin, a few Kelvin. Okay. Now I'm going to probe it with light that is H bar omega, which is invisible. Well, maybe near IR. That's basically what we've been doing. So this means that uh, uh, in terms of in terms of uh, temperature, it's a couple of thousands of Kelvin. Okay. Now, um, as it is always the case, if you have such an expansion and you have frequency that is much larger than the gap, uh, there is a reduction uh, basically by uh, the size of the gap square over the frequency square. Okay? So this is already alarming. In fact, if I look now, I try to estimate the size of the effect, then uh, for simplicity, I'm going to say that, that uh, uh, the magnitude of the gaps in, in, in the band of uh, orbit, one orbital is zero, is, uh, is delta uh, one one and delta two two. Let's say they are the same, okay? Give them some amplitude delta naught, which is going to be, of course, of the order of TC, okay? In Stonsim ruthenate, it's going to be uh, two delta over KTC. In fact, it's very close to three and a half as expected from, from BCS. Um, and then, um, uh, if you did not uh, notice, uh, okay, I didn't, uh, if you go through the calculations, I, I actually did not, I did not uh, point it out to you guys earlier uh, in, the, in these lectures, but scale of care effect, in fact, is the fine structure constant. Uh, you can see it from the, from the uh, constants that come up front. So I have this. I have this interband coupling, and it's divided by the average indices of refraction for that material. N is of order one, two, three, whatever. N squared minus one is also of the order of one, two, three. So this is all, uh, and, and then epsilon one, two uh, uh, estimate, believe me, is of order of a few. Uh, then I have uh, one good thing, because if I'm looking at the wavelengths divided by uh, interatomic distance, which is uh, what I need to consider if I'm looking at, at uh, the, uh, the xy direction, uh, so I, have, I have some, some um, uh, magnification here. But then I have this reduction. And then I have the fine structure constant that, that uh, uh, is something that reduces the magnitude by 1 over uh, one of uh, uh, 137. So you put it all together, and if I'm using light at 10 to the 15 hertz, which is uh, what I'm going to use, I'm going to use light at 1.55 micron wavelengths, which is the wavelengths of optical communication. The reason is the cheapest components one can buy are at this wavelength. So when we started these experiments, um, we used that. Um, and take n equal to uh, on the index of refraction of three, which is typical for, for these materials uh, in these wavelengths, um, and Tc of order one, I expect a care effect of order 50 to 100 nanoradians. Okay, I showed you the magnitude for typical ferromagnets. It's uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.01 radians, okay, or 10 to the minus two, some even 10 to the minus 1 radian. So this is 50 to 100 nanoradians. That's uh, a reduction by a factor of a million or, or 10 to the 7. This is really, really tiny. Nobody ever measured something that tiny uh, in optical rotation. So how do, how do we do that? And you remember also uh, this difficulty of, of uh, separating reciprocal from non-reciprocal effects. 
Reciprocal effects may rotate, polariza may rotate uh, the, the linear polarization, therefore uh, have a problem. And what we need is really to get rid of all that. So we come back to the definition of a good experiment now to look for time reversal symmetry breaking uh, in these superconductors where the effect is expected to be very, very small. Okay? First, we need to reject all reciprocal effects such as linear birefringence, optical activity that is chirality like in quartz, uh, etc. We need to reject it to, to an unbelievable uh, uh, level. Preferably, if we can get rid of it by symmetry, that's the best. We need to measure an absolute value. I cannot modulate the material with magnetic field to measure time reversal symmetry breaking because if I put the magnetic field, I broke time reversal symmetry. The material is very different than a strictly zero magnetic field. And now I have this, oh, sorry, now I have this new requirement. I need to be able to measure at sensitivity much below, in fact, 100 nanoradians because I want to track the transition. So obviously, if there is an effect, it's going to start at zero and then builds up, and that's kind of the maximum uh, value that, that I expect. So this is really very, very tiny effect. So let's recall two things that we talked about. One was, how do I create the time reverse state? I use a mirror. And in that case, I have a beam that goes one way through the material compared to the beam that goes the other way through the material. That's in a Faraday configuration, okay? The other thing that we recall is the uh, issue of reciprocity. Reciprocity says that uh, time reverse asymmetry, if time reverse asymmetry is obeyed, then it doesn't matter if the source is here and the detector is here, or the source is here and the detector is here, uh, the result should be exactly the same. The best would have been if I could do these two experiments simultaneously and compare them. So when you do such an experiment in, in, in which you have two beams that are doing something and you compare them, uh, you basically create an interferometer. If one of them, of course, you modulate, you created an interferometer. So let me tell you about the interferometer that we are using. For that, I need to remind you of something that I hope you saw uh, in ENM optics, etc., uh, which is something that is called the Saniac effect. In fact, people knew about the Saniac effect already at the end of the 19th century. Um, what is the Saniac effect? Well, take a light source. I'll call it a laser. That's what we use now, but a light source. Uh, let's go through a polarizer. That's going to be important uh, for, for detection, but otherwise, uh, um, it doesn't matter exactly but for this part, but let's, let's take a polarizer. I have now a linearly polarized light, and now I'm going through a beam splitter. There are mirrors here that allow me to have, through the beam splitter, to have two beams, one going clockwise and the other one going counterclockwise. And remember, the polarization is linear in this, okay? Now, obviously, the two beams go through the exact same optical path. When two beams go through the exact same optical path and then interfere as they come back through the beam splitter and interfere at the detector, then there is constructive interference and no phase shift between these two beams, right? Okay, so I see a nice constructive interference. I can look at it and say nothing happens. However, if you take the whole apparatus and you now rot sorry, rotate it with some angular velocity omega, then you broke the time reverse asymmetry because of rotation. Remember, rotation breaks time reverse asymmetry. And I broke it between the clockwise and counterclockwise propagating beams. Why? For example, as I rotate the whole apparatus, I launch the beam through the beam splitter. It takes now, the, the speed of light is constant, it takes now more time for the clockwise propagating beam to reach the beam splitter than the counter propagating beam. This tiny difference in time translates into a phase shift here at the detector. 
And you can show that this phase shift is proportional to the angular velocity by which you rotate the whole apparatus and to the area enclosed by the apparatus. And if you did not know, the second experiment of Michelson, from Michelson and Morley, uh, in which the speed of light was shown to be constant, and in fact, uh, the speed of light could be determined in a better accuracy in that experiment, uh, was a Sanyak experiment in which he built, this is his uh, paper in Nature uh, from 1925. Uh, this is a short paper. I want everybody to try and publish such a short paper in Nature uh, without supplementary information, um, et cetera. Um, he published it in 25. He built a Sanyak loop just like what I showed you here. Uh, he built it, uh, it, it was 2,000 feet long, 1,000 feet here, and he, and he uh, uh, evacuated it. And uh, of course, it was uh, supposed to, to detect ether at the time, uh, which he didn't, but he was able to measure the speed of light with, with pretty good, with pretty good uh, uh, accuracy. Uh, and and uh, 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 was the second, the, the second of his experiments uh, in, that, in that direction. Okay, what, what we are going to do is we are going uh, from this Michelson experiment, uh, we are going, uh, what, about 60, 70 years later uh, when people started to use fiber optics and realized that instead of using mirrors, I can actually launch the experiment into a fiber. And I, I can make a fiber loop and launch it into a fiber and I can rotate that fiber. Now you remember the, the the uh, formula that says that the phase shift that I'm going to detect at the detector is proportional to the area enclosed by the loop. Now, you remember, how do you make a magnet uh, um, from, from a loop of electric current? You just wind it and wind it many, many times, and each time you wind it, uh, you increase the, the, the magnetic field that you can uh, have in the center of that magnet. Well, the exact same thing is here. Every time that you make, you wind that fiber, uh, you enclose another area A and another area A. And a, about, at about 100, uh, at about one kilometer of a fiber, uh, you can reach that if you use earth rotation. By the way, that's what, of course, uh, what, what Michelson used. He used earth rotation as the apparatus that rotated that 2,000 by 1,000 feet uh, loop. So what you do is uh, you, make, you make a solenoid, if you want, out of the fiber, a fiber optic, and you can increase the signal. And it's about, if you take one kilometer at a diameter of, say, 20 centimeters, believe me, you get about 100 micro radians of phase shift. Now, what's the important thing? The important thing is that, of course, first of all, we are going to use it as a magnetometer. We don't need to wind it many times. In fact, we don't want any rotation sensitivity whatsoever. So we are going to make the loop as small as possible. And in fact, we are going to get rid of the loop. But the other thing uh, that, that uh, we are going to uh, do is simply look at it and see immediately that because I have these two counter-propagating beams that are coming to the, to the detector to interfere, it has these both properties. It has this property of like putting a mirror and having the same beam coming back, but now they are doing it simultaneously, and like uh, really realizing on the reciprocity within the same apparatus. Okay? Because I have the source and the detector, or this, the detector and the source, you can exchange them. These are these two beams that are coming together and are going to interfere at the detector. So uh, the only way, a, a other component I need in order to make it uh, into an interferometer, remember interferometer, you have two beams that are going to interfere. You take one beam and you modulate it, and then you look at the, modulate, at the modulation uh, at some detector, this is an interferometer. Well, that's exactly right in the Michelson Morley. Uh, you, you modulate the length. Here you modulate the phase. And there are ways to do that. I'm not going to go into the 
details of how to do that, but it's easy. It's very easy to do it. And what you do is you get, you get an apparatus that uh, is immune completely to any reciprocal effect because there are these two beams that are going uh, in the opposite direction, interfering uh, at the detector, and then uh, that's it. So how do I make it into a magnetometer? Well, I take the fiber, I use scissors of high quality, and I cut it. So the first thing that comes to mind is I want to use it as a magnetometer. And I have this linearly polarized light running in that loop. Remember, linearly polarized light, any linear polarization, is the sum of the two circular polarizations. What I want to do is I want to compare beam going with the magnetization to compare it with a beam going against the magnetization. So I'm going to use a single a, a, a circular polarization. How do I achieve circular polarization out of linear polarization? It's a question. How do you get circular polarization? No, no. You know, what, what do you do in the lab when, when, when you did experiments uh, that, I, I don't know, first year, second year? Quarter wave plates, that's it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put two quarter wave plates. If you put them 90 degrees to each other, then you did nothing because uh, there is this linearly polarized light becomes circular polarization, polarization goes complete the loop, and then in the other direction, complete the loop, nothing happens, OK? But now I have this cavity here in which I can put my sample. And if I put the sample, then remember, it matters whether the circular polarization going with the magnetization versus against the magnetization. So now I mimicked that mechanical rotation that, that Sanyak first used uh, by using this simple uh, device. And if this does not exist, time reversal symmetry, I mean, this apparatus is completely reciprocal and I can get zero like zero is zero. Uh, but then if I do put a material with magnetization, I'm going to get a phase shift. Okay? And this phase shift is a measure of the magnetization. Or if you want, it's the Faraday. Actually, it's twice the Faraday angle of this material. You can put, and we did, you can put here any material that rotate polarization such as quartz, sugar solution, uh, anything that, that you can think of uh, that has optical activity. You can uh, put a Polaroid material. You will not see it. The zero stays zero. And this is simply because it's a completely reciprocal apparatus. But if you put uh, in between a material that does break time reversal symmetry, such a magnet, immediately you get a phase shift. OK, so this is uh, at the time of the anions. I told you about it. And that's how we started this research uh, in 1990. This is from my own lab notebook. The reason that, that I actually did the experiment, despite the fact that, that I already had students, uh, is that my student that was doing the experiment uh, was part of the Stanford band. And at that year, Stanford made it to the final four. Uh, and he was the trumpet guy in the band. And then he was weighing, uh, doing the really important experiment, playing for the band. He decided to play with the, with the band. So this is from my own lab notebook in which I calibrated the, the, the apparatus. And this is just a, a, the simple fiber optic gyroscope that, that was, was uh, uh, in, in a next by, uh, uh, next to our laboratory. Uh, that's why we use the full, the full one, uh, which allowed us to calibrate it with rotation and then uh, putting high TC films uh, that were supposed to give us, remember, 200 uh, uh, milliradians. And it's zero to as zero can be. Okay. Um, now, going now uh, fast forward 
uh, to the years not of any on superconductivity, but of time reversal symmetry breaking systems such as Tonsum Ruthenate, etc. Um, the idea was that we needed uh, an even more, more sensitive apparatus. I gave you the, the estimate, it should be of order uh, or, or smaller than 100 nano radians. So, how do we do that? Well, if you look at the loop here, you see that there is a line of symmetry here. I mean, here I'm going through the material. Okay, you can see it here. I go through the material. Uh, that's the Faraday effect. But if the beam that came from here was reflected back, then I would measure the care effect. But what about this beam? Well, this line of symmetry, I can really fold. I can fold this part onto this part and have the two beams going in the same fiber. Question is, is this possible? Well, yes, it is possible. Because we were using uh, optical communication fibers, and optical communication fibers, if you didn't know, now you, you, you know, that they are polarization maintaining. That is, they are birefringent. And in optical communication, only one of the, of the uh, modes, the, uh, I don't remember if it's the fast or slow, uh, is being used. Okay, think about, think about a birefringent material and you're uh, using only one of the principal axes. Okay? So we said, well, we can really use those two axes uh, and make a Sanya loop with zero area. So that's when you fold it back and I want now these two beams to be in the same fiber. Here is how we do it. So remember, the fiber is birefringent. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take, let's say, linearly polarized light along the slow axis, which is blue here. OK? So it propagates in the fiber. Uh, the fiber has some, I mean, it, it's relatively long. So anything that leaks into the other direction doesn't matter. It comes to, out of the fiber. I have now a single quarter wave plate. Remember, I folded this lo that loop. So I have now circularly polarized light in this, this direction. I reflect it back. Then uh, what I have now is through the quarter wave plate, I have the circularly polarized light uh, that in the frame of the fiber is in the op opposite direction. And therefore, it comes back 90 degrees. That is in the fast axis. Going in on the slow axis, coming back in the fast axis. The other beam, I'm going to launch into the fast axis, and I'm going to come back in the slow axis. So I achieved a Sanya loop with zero, strictly zero area. OK? So I started from here. That's the cartoon I just showed you. And everything uh, can be uh, done the exact same thing. But now I do it in reflection, and I get not twice the Faraday, but rather twice the care effect. OK. So uh, it turned that we achieved uh, an apparatus with extremely high uh, sensitivity, very robust, uh, we, because we can get down to, uh, uh, very, uh, I mean, to very low powers. Uh, uh, we, can, we can go to low temperatures. Uh, this was supposed to be theta. Uh, it changed the, the font. Uh, but the most important thing is that by symmetry, the Sanyak interferometer measures only non-reciprocal effects. And that's the important thing. It's the fact that it does it by symmetry. I don't need to, you know, people who measure Hall effect, for example, uh, to get high sensitivity, if the Hall effect is small compared to any perturbation, they measure it with the field up, then with the field down, they subtract, divide by two, they have the whole effect, OK? But if I have to do it here, it is like, like uh, measuring in one direction uh, uh, one billion and one, and in the other direction one billion. I needed then to subtract one billion and one minus one billion and, and hope that I don't have anything else which is much larger, which of course I do, OK? But if you do it by symmetry, as this apparatus does it for you, then that's it. So uh, that's the principle, and that's what we did, and it worked. Uh, I'm going to skip that. That's the way uh, you can actually look. This is a little bit more technical. Uh, you can look at it uh, in the 
notes uh, how, how you, it got eliminated. The important thing is that uh, with this apparatus, we were able to get to short noise limited optical detection above three microwatt. For those of you that do do experiments uh, in dilution refrigerators, uh, three microwatt allows you to go down uh, 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 even to, to uh, 10, 20 millikelvin. So I can go now to very low temperatures, way much below any TC of the materials that we are going to measure. And as I said before, the most important thing, uh, complete rejection of all reciprocal effects. And it's a beam. I have this quarter wave plate. Uh, I can also use a lens, as long as the lens is reciprocal. Uh, and, and I'm going to penetrate one optical penetration depth. OK? OK, that's, again, technical. So the first thing you, you want to do is simple measurement. Uh, so this is, uh, this strontium ruthenium O3 has a, it's a ferromagnet, has a TC of 150. We measure it now with, a, uh, with one of the early, yes? I'll show you. Um, so you, you see it already here that um, I, have, I have a film of strontium ruthenate. I get a very small signal. By the way, anybody guess why do I get a small signal? The, the beam size, by the way, is about 10 microns. Why do I get a small signal? I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a ferromagnet. I expect, and I showed you at the beginning that, that I, I get for this, for this material at low temperatures, I get about 10 milliradians. Why, why do I have only a few, a few microradians? Domains. It breaks into domains. Some of the domains are up, some are down. In principle, I should get zero. However, I will not because of random statistics, of Gaussian statistics. Uh, so I get a finite number. So if I do this experiment many times, as I did here, OK? So you see, sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative. That is the residual if you do Gaussian statistics. Sometimes of these domains give you up, give you down. Sometimes it's very close to zero. You asked about resolution. Well, you see, this goes way below a one, one microradians. Uh, and I can track the transition, OK? So I can do statistics of that. And if I do statistics, and this is actually uh, showing that indeed the beam size is much larger than the domain size. The domains are here viewed using Lorentz microscopy for those that know what it is. Uh, and uh, what you find, uh, you can do uh, statistics of uh, how many and find what is the nat natural effect uh, simply by doing domain statistics. But uh, you can also cool it in magnetic field. Therefore, it's going to cool down uh, with all the domains aligned, and you'll get the full number, which is uh, here it's only down to 90 Kelvin. You get 2 milliradians at 90 Kelvin, OK? By, by the time you are at 4 Kelvin, it's about 10 milliradians. So it all works. But it also tells me, how do I want to do the experiments of these time reversal symmetry breaking superconductors? Well, that's another type of, type of experiment. Let me, because of time, uh, let me move to some measurements. And I'm going to start with two examples uh, of different type uh, before I move to, to another uh, uh, more, I mean, broader uh, uh, subject of, of heavy fermions. So, in fact, what prompted uh, us to go back to the apparatus uh, and ask how can we make it more sensitive, how can we measure much smaller effects, uh, was the fact that strontium ruthenate uh, was, was uh, discovered and was uh, predicted to be uh, a superconductor that breaks time reversal symmetry, but now in the normal way. That is P plus IP. I'll show you why. Uh, well, first of all, if you didn't know strontium ruthenate, that is strontium 2 ruthenium 4 This is not strontium ruthenium 3 which is the cubic uh, material. This is the layered material. It's isostructural to the first Bernus and Müller uh, high temperature superconductor, isostructural to lanthanum uh, 2 uh, copper O4, uh, 
At that time, I mean, for high TC, it was docked with barium, the first, the first paper. And then uh, uh, band structure uh, uh, calculations as well as uh, measurements using ARPES and, and, and using uh, uh, quantum oscillations determined that there are three bands. Uh, and that's the picture of the bands cutting the, the, fir the Fermi surface. Uh, and there are these bands alpha, uh, beta, and gamma. And in the z direction, it seems to be cylindrical. So it's really quasi two-dimensional material, as was determined from these measurements. So what is then uh, strontium-2, ruthenium-04? It's a quasi two-dimensional material uh, predicted to be strongly correlated Fermi liquid. Uh, why? Because uh, Andy McKenzie measured uh, the temperature dependence of the resistivity down to very low temperatures before TC. He showed that T square uh, is, is restored at low temperatures, uh, which is a signature of, of uh, Fermi liquid. And quantum oscillations uh, were, uh, were shown to exist, which, uh, of course, helped to determine the band structure of this material. Now, also, um, um, well, um, th there were some other measurements, uh, I'm not going into all the details, uh, which, which uh, showed that uh, it's consistent with the uh, spin uh, triplet and uh, uh, extractions of uh, Fermi liquid parameters for this material showed that it's, it looks very much like helium-3. Helium-3 uh, has phases, actually one phase, the helium-3A, that breaks time reversal symmetry in a way that was predicted also for, for this material. So what do we know? We know that this crystal structure is like that. And then uh, soon after the discovery, TC was measured as a function of the residual resistivity. That is the purity of the material. And it was shown that uh, TC plunges uh, down as a function of uh, in, uh, increasing the, the disorder, very much like magnetic impurities in a, in a BCS normal superconductor, conventional superconductor. Uh, this is a signature of unconventional superconductivity. If you remember uh, this, this uh, argument of, of averaging the, the pair wave function over the Fermi surface. And uh, spin triplet pairing was shown uh, uh, to be the most, uh, the most uh, reasonable uh, one, uh, 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 most reasonable for pairing uh, when uh, uh, Ishida showed that, that uh, uh, the, the spin susceptibility uh, does not change as it should have been for, a, a, for a, an S-wave superconductor. An S-wave superconductor, uh, as the uh, Cooper pairs condense, you have more and more pairs, and they do not contribute to spin susceptibility because the Cooper pairs uh, are spin zero, S equals zero. Uh, so that's why you have reduction in spin susceptibility, but now, uh, it was shown not to change through TC, a signature of S equal to one. In addition, uh, people did uh, phase sensitive measurements to determine uh, whether, um, uh, I mean, what is the, the, the symmetry. Uh, if it is indeed uh, a spin triplet, spin triplet, then uh, you expect that if you go uh, in one direction, uh, that is, you connect, I'm, I'm not sure if you guys remember the phase sensitive measurements that, that were used to determine this uh, uh, symmetry, order parameter symmetry in high TC, uh, but uh, these, were, these were edge uh, symmetry here. It was uh, uh, opposite direction because this is what uh, will tell you uh, whether, whether uh, you have uh, the same or opposite sign uh, on both sides uh, where the same, and, and, and basically, uh, you see that the critical current as a function of small magnetic field is zero in this configuration. It's maximum in this configuration. Very consistent with spin, spin triplet. Um, however, time of asymmetry breaking needed to be uh, uh, shown. Spin triplet does not mean time of asymmetry breaking. But uh, even with these measurements, uh, it led uh, Maurice Rice and, and Manfred Sigrist, as well as uh, Baskaran, uh, to 
to uh, analyze uh, the spin triplet evidence, the fourfold symmetry of this material, uh, and then adding to it uh, weak coupling. I don't have it here, but if you look at the specific heat, the specific heat looks very much like a BCS specific heat, really a signature of, of weak coupling. Uh, and then assuming weak spin orbit coupling, uh, they came up uh, with a particular, uh, with a particular uh, 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 symmetry prediction for this material. Um, uh, because of time, I'm going to skip all these. Uh, you can go over to see uh, how they did it. This is the table of all possible symmetries when you have spin triplet. Uh, this one, for example, is consistent with the B phase of helium-3. Uh, but this one, only this one, the P plus IP, is consistent with the A phase of helium-3. And that is uh, the, the symmetry. So let me show it to you here. Uh, this is a cartoon from Yoshima Eno, uh, who is the discoverer of this material. Um, and then we said that, uh, what are the things we said? We said that it is spin triplet. Okay, spin triplet uh, means that the, angle, the, the, the L should be 1, 3, etc. So let's, uh, 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 it was predicted uh, by these people to be uh, L equal 1. So that's P plus IP. Okay, uh, and then uh, remember the two-dimensionality, okay? So you put these together, uh, so if I have LZ equal to one, I, I can have, I can have uh, uh, plus one, zero, and minus one. But if it's quasi two-dimensional, I, I put the electrons in the plane, uh, then it immediately select only the P plus IP, and uh, I have either the a, a, a Cooper pair rotating one way or the other, the spin triplet, on the other hand, uh, does not need for each Cooper pair, it's a random direction. So the average is going to be zero, but the angular momentum is in either plus or minus. The degeneracy is two, just like an Ising model, time reversal symmetry is broken. And if you remember the uh, first lecture, we said that, oh, people can use uh, muon uh, to, to, to uh, detect such time reversal symmetry breaking. Uh, and indeed, this was done by uh, Graham Luke uh, et al. Uh, and they indeed found that there is a change in the uh, uh, muon relaxation. Uh, they found extra relaxation below one and a half Kelvin, which is the TC of this material. Uh, they determined that the internal fields were of order of about half a Gauss. Now, this is really the limit of what mu SR can do uh, in determine uh, internal magnetic fields. Uh, so it already shows you that the effect is tiny. The effect is tiny in mu SR. It's therefore expected to be tiny uh, also in the optical regime. This is our measurements. So who asked the sensitivity? Here it is. This is measurement of the Kerr angle using that Sanyak apparatus. The way we do it, we measure in, a, in an environment, uh, double mu metal, uh, which therefore the environment is below, below uh, uh, three milligauss, not Tesla, three milligauss. Um, you uh, cool the material and then you measure as you warm it up. Um, yes, there is scatter, but as you can see, below one and a half Kelvin, there is a finite care effect. Uh, if you uh, fit it to some order parameter, uh, then you see that at zero temperature, it will be of the order of 100 nano radians, as we estimated. Uh, but I can track the transition. I mean, this is 20 nano radians. I can track the transition. This shows you the sensitivity of the apparatus. Yes? Excellent question. Obviously, I would expect, and there are, I unfortunately don't have, it, don't have it here, but at zero field, this was exactly, uh, this was uh, the maximum that we could measure. So that's, I'm, I'm showing it here. We had, we had cool downs in which you see nothing. We had cool downs in which you see one direction and then another. Uh, and, and uh, well, we did not do as many cool downs as we did for the ferromagnet. It's, it's a little bit more tedious 
uh, measurement, but overall, uh, not always you get this, this large effect. But this means that I want to make sure that this large effect is the maximum. How do I do that? Just like in the ferromagnet, I'm going to cool it in a field because magnetic field couples to the time reverse asymmetry uh, or the parameter, and therefore I'm going to see what I get. And this is it. Here we cooled it in, in plus 100 Gauss, then turned the field down, but just before turning the field down, we measured uh, the, uh, uh, these, two, these two points, OK? So this, and these two points were measured on top of some background, because when you turn on a magnetic field, the optical fiber and, and the components give you some background. So you subtract it. That's why here it's delta theta curve. The previous one was full, nothing else, delta curve. And then you can cool it in negative magnetic field, say minus 50 Gauss. You see, it's the same. And you see that we get to, a, at, at, at about half a Kelvin, we get to the exact same size of the effect. OK? So this really tells you it's a genuine effect. Now, I want to pause in a minute and uh, talk about, again, it will be related to domains and will be related to this issue of, of uh, did you say peace? Oh, I thought you said peace. Oh. OK. Um, so, so uh, uh, and that's the thing that, that if you take a finite size ferromagnet, uh, you, you probably know that we expect uh, uh, edge currents. You take this finite size material, you expect edge currents. Pictorially, it's very easy to understand. If I have these loops and I add them all together, uh, of course, if it's infinite, I get, I get uh, just the magnetization, nothing at the, at the edge. But if I have the edge, then you see that I can add up all these to get an edge current. OK? That's a cartoon that basically shows you why I expect edge currents. Uh, but of course, edge currents will be canceled uh, like any other thing by Meissner. So you need to compare the extent of the edge currents uh, with, with, uh, which, uh, with the extent of the Meissner. The edge currents scale is going to be the coherence length. The Meissner scale is the penetration depth, as you remember, I hope. Uh, so if they are not the same, uh, then there should be some, something left. And people try to measure it. Uh, the group of Catherine Moller, uh, among other groups, um, try to measure it, and they saw nothing. Okay. Uh, here is their second paper, the more uh, uh, detailed paper. Uh, basically, this is the result. They didn't uh, find any edge currents, uh, which uh, of course means that something needs to be understood. Okay. So let me uh, summarize Stonesy Wolfenate. Uh, we saw that time reverse asymmetry is broken. Maybe it's broken not because of P plus IP. There are other possibilities, including non-unitary non type of, of uh, order parameters. The signal onset at TC, uh, it looks like I can fit to it an order parameter that is proportional to TC minus T. That's what you expect. Uh, order parameter is expected to, to be proportional to the gap square, uh, therefore T minus TC. Uh, the, the domain size based on the beam size that we were using uh, seems to be uh, relatively large domains because only on occasions we saw these cancellations, etc. cetera. Uh, and uh, based on the fact that we cooled in a field and find the same type of effect, uh, we can determine that fluxes uh, are not uh, responsible for, for the effect. Uh, we also did measurements as a function of power, uh, optical power, just to make sure that we don't have some local heating and therefore some effects like that, uh, and, and uh, they were. So the only thing that is still missing for Stonesy Multinate is the absence of, of uh, edge currents. Uh, and I should say, despite the fact that this was the motivation for these measurements, and the fact that uh, was the first measurement that showed a finite care effect uh, of this magnitude, uh, the, the story of Stonesy 2 Ruthenium 04 is not finished yet. I think somebody wants me to finish because he's hungry and he wants to go for dinner. So I should I should I stop? 
Yes, and then we'll ask questions. Okay. okay. Who wants to stay two more minutes to hear about that? Okay, only one. We'll, we'll talk later. Uh, so I will stop here. Th these are going to be online, so. Um, but this could be used for other uh, type of, of time reversal symmetry breaking superconductors, such as superconductor ferromagnet bilayer. Uh, now you induce the time reversal symmetry breaking uh, using the ferromagnet. You create now a system with, with P wave with P-wave superconductivity in an artificial way, and we could detect it. And of course, I didn't have time to talk about uh, these in heavy fermions, uh, but all these, these are going to be in the notes, which I'm going to distribute. So you will be able to uh, display it for yourselves. Thank you. <laughs>